Mark Ruffalo, uh, welcome. I uh, just want to congratulate you, first of all, on your two Emmy nominations for The Normal Heart. Uh, you're nominated for Best Actor in a Movie or Miniseries for the lead role as Ned Weeks, and also you're nominated for producing it. Uh, you know, the movie adaptation has sort of been long gestating for this project. Uh, I was wondering how, you know, how and when you came on board, uh, you know, with the project. You could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I um, I joined it um, when Ryan Murphy actually uh, got the rights, which is about four years ago, uh, maybe three years ago. And um, at that point, he uh, he reached out to me and he said that um, he thought that. I would make a good partner uh, with him uh, to do it. I, I didn't know uh, that he actually had made up his mind to cast me. I thought we were just meeting, and uh, he, he told me that he he wanted me to do it, and he felt that I'd make a good partner and would I produce it with him, and um, and we would take it around and shop it around and see if we could get it made somewhere. And uh, what was your familiarity, if any, uh, with the play before before you uh, came on board with the film? You know, it was one of those plays that um, was so important uh, in in my time as a young actor, and uh, it was it was you. Every young actor worked on it in in acting class, and so uh, we really broke it down. We really um, uh, worked hard on it. Uh, it would be months, two months. Uh, people were working on it in the class, so we we really would dig into the material and so I I had a, a, a very deep working understanding of that material um, coming into it. Joe Mantello played the lead uh, role that you play now on the Broadway, the most recent Broadway version and of course he's in this production in a different part, uh, also yeah. Emmy nominated by the way. Did, what yeah. kind of advice did you get from him since he had played it so many times? Um, you know I, I uh, <laughs> my headline was always, you know, w wish we could have, uh, Mark Ruffalo was fine in the part, but wished we'd seen uh, Joe Mantello in it. Um, you know, he's uh, he's such a gifted actor and director, and um, the funny thing was is, is we became very close um, friends uh, working on it, and um, he I asked him, and he said, "I don't have anything to tell you. Actually, I wanted to know if you could help me with uh, doing a film. I, I, I've only done theater, and I I don't really know what to do uh, on a film set." And um, that became a back and forth of emails between us, which I thought was very sweet and kind uh, of him. Um, and I mean. He, he did an incredible job, and he would have been a great Ned Weeks as well. Um, and so it was very, uh, it was a big blessing to have him be part of it and to have him embrace me so thoroughly throughout the process. Um, many times I would sort of look to him like, mm, what do you think? And he would always give me some encouraging um piece of um, uh, not direction but but um, love you know so, so something wonderful he, he he made me feel at ease in that part very early on now, uh, in addition to working with Joe Mantello who played the role on stage you're also you know working with uh, Larry Kramer who wrote the screenplay and also wrote the original play and and you know the character you play in that weeks is you know it's inspired by his own experiences uh, you know, you know. How, tell me about working with him to, uh, uh, you know, how much you worked with him to 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 work on this character and, and develop it. Well, I um, I, I immediately uh, wanted to spend as much time as possible with him, and so uh, very early on, probably a year or so before we even started shooting, um, we we met. Um, then as we became, as it got closer, we met again and I ended up spending uh, several days with him. Um, and he was giving me uh, books to read, uh, a lot of his stuff, um, and I was watching a lot of video. But the time that I spent with Larry w was really invaluable and 
he made it clear to me that he <laughs> that Ned Weeks was not him. Um, but I couldn't. As I got to know him, and, and and he opened his heart to me um, and his life to me, he, I, I couldn't help but feel that you know there was quite a bit of autobiographical material in there, and I started to see something uh, in him that I don't think was ever portrayed in the media before. I don't know, if there, you know, sort of. Gave him the title "The Angriest Man in um, the Angriest Gay Man in the World" or what have you, but my experience of him was was he was deeply compassionate. He uh, was funny and charming and charismatic and and sensitive. Um, and I'd seen all the videos, you know, I, 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 I studied him. Uh, anything that was available, I, I studied. And I began to see there was two sides to Larry Kramer, and one of them hadn't fully ever been sort of exposed, or we hadn't really heard the story of this gentler side of him. And so I pulled on a lot of things. I pulled on physicality. I pulled on some of his vocal qualities. Um, but mostly it was his heart that, that struck me as the most profound uh, part about him and his deep and abiding sense of love that he has for his culture. You're all up for just tons of Emmys uh, all across the technical categories. I don't think we've seen an acting nomination like this since uh, Angels in America. So many of your castmates uh, nominated, especially in supporting actor. As one of the producers and one of the guys starring alongside of all these others, what, what does that mean to you? I, uh, I'm deeply moved by it, just to be frank. Um, it's, um, it was a very important uh, experience for me and I think for my, my fellow actors. And um, the, that time in American history is, it hasn't been really well recorded in, in a modern sense. Um, and so we all knew how important the story was that we were telling. We knew how important it was to so many people who had lost their lives. We knew how important it was to so many people who had lived through this incredibly difficult and tragic time in American history. And so <laughs> to see it embraced um, on the level that it has, and I, and I know to the extent with which my fellow actors and everyone on that crew and in uh, on our team put themselves out there uh, and and made themselves vulnerable and and did things that they had never done before and were fearless and courageous. Um, to have all that acknowledged in the way that it has by the uh, the height of the success that a television venture like this could have in the Emmys is incredibly satisfying and humbling and moving to me. Uh, you yourself have have a history of, of, of activism, you know, environmental and, and equal rights. Uh, I'm wondering if that if that had you know if that helped you relate to this story and and, and these characters' struggle. Yeah, it's a you know. There's a dynamic in the activist world. There, there are Larry Kramers in almost in, in every movement, and um, and there's there's a there's kind of a politics and a hierarchy, and there's um, infighting, and there's power struggles, and so on and so forth. And so I I really did I did understand that, and I understand what it takes um, to ch to make change happen and what it costs you to do it, and how high the stakes are. Now, you know, I'm dealing with things that aren't as existentially threatening as the AIDS crisis was to them. Um, uh, so I, I, can't, I can't say that um, I know exactly what they went through. But I know the nature of it, and I know the nature of that group dynamic, and I know the nature of, of people 
fighting um, a battle that that looks like it's impossible to win and um, and so I was able to relate uh, to a lot of, of the material based on, on on my understanding and my experience in, in that field. You know the last few years we talked about this with several people in, uh, in recent years so many film stars like yourself are finding great projects on TV. Just look at your category alone here. You've got Benedict, Idris, Chiwetel, Billy Bob, Martin, yourself. You're all film stars doing television projects. Why is that line blurring so much these days? You know, you hear, uh, you, you constantly hear that um, now is the is TV's golden age and that uh, you'll hear actors when you're talking amongst other actors saying all the great stuff is in television now, the great characters, the great writing. Um, you know, could it be that uh, this medium has, has sort of reached its maturity um, and that, um, that this line between film and television that even 10 years ago was was very delineated was was uh, clear has kind of vanished um, and I think because of uh, where HBO and Showtime and a lot of the cable networks were able to go with television and uh, tackle um, language, sexuality, all of these things that were that used to only be doable in film, all of a sudden has washed away any preconceived notions of what's possible. The other thing is, is as the film market sort of shrinks, this other market is developing. And a movie like, um, like The Normal Heart, uh, would never, I'm not, I don't think, would ever be able to reach the amount of people that it was able to reach with HBO. And so that's that alone is a very powerful, compelling reason to 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 be part of such a um, a wonderful medium as television is today. Uh, it's interesting. Well, when the film uh, Normal Heart was was shooting, it was actually you know. It was shooting while the defense of, of Marriage Act was being struck down, uh, uh, and and we've heard you know actors talk before about the experience of finding out on set uh, uh, that the that the you know Doma went down. Uh, did that change your perspective on the film going forward after that happened? You know, uh, the film had a, you know, sometimes you do a project and it and and, and the stars seem to align for it. Um, from strange things like uh, we need sunlight for this one particular scene and it's been raining all day and we're going to go for it and hope that there's sunlight and all of a sudden the clouds part and there's the sun. Or we need to get this shot and we need it to be, uh, we, we can't do it in the rain and uh, the giant storm is moving in and we don't know if we're going to be able to get it and 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 the storm holds until we get the shot and uh, and to the very last second. Um, so there was there was, this movie had that kind of grace around it, and and you could sense it. And um, that day th th there was a beautiful confluence of of events. It was the the doma uh, was being argued or or the decision was coming out. And that was the same day that we were shooting um, the scene in the when they when they made the most amount of money that the 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 movement had ever made fifty thousand dollars right and it also happened to be the day that the president of HBO was there and it also happened to be the day that Larry Kramer was well enough to come and visit us on set and we hadn't seen him in weeks and so. It all came together in this beautiful moment. We came to work, and the gay men's choir was there, and there was uh, people um, in their AIDS uh, makeup on, um, standing around, and Larry was there in a wheelchair, and we got the news, and Larry announced it to the group, and it was one of those beatific sort of moments where. 
it you sort of understand what you're doing. It's context in the relationship of history. Um, it's context in the relationship of the personal. Larry Kramer sitting there in a wheelchair fighting for his life. And <laughs> And, and all of the people around you who put their heart and soul in, into this endeavor, uh, it didn't go lost on any of them. And the, the fruition that, it, that Larry's work had finally in some way had come to uh, be recognized, had, had, had in some way taken a major step forward. Um, none of that went wasted on anybody. So, so <laughs> it was... It was a beautiful, beautiful kind of icing on the cake to a, uh, to a really beautiful production. It's so good that you, all of you could realize that when it's going on in the moment, because I'm sure that's difficult when you're when you're you know shooting all day to, to, to have those kinds of moments. It never, it, I don't, I it never happens. Never happened to me. Little things, special little, you know, little magical things happen, but nothing that had such a historical side, sort of multi-leveled um, meaning uh, on a set. It was, it was quite extraordinary, and I'll never forget it. Well, I want to switch gears a little bit. You've got two films out this year. One's already been released, Begin Again, and Foxcatcher's been at Con and will be out in America later in this year. Both of them seem like they may be getting into this awards circuit later in the year, and you've, you've been down that road before. In fact, a couple of the websites I've seen have you ranked number one as Best Supporting Actor for Foxcatcher to actually win the Oscar. So because we, we probably will re be replaying this video over in uh, the Oscar season, tell us about um, just getting caught up again in that, in, that, in that award season with Oscars and Globes and SAG Awards and all that. I dread it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's so it's it's very nerve wracking and um, and you you get so you you you're sort of you're sort of in two worlds. You sort of want to see something wonderful <laughs> like an award happen to you, um, but at the same time you you're sort of trying to not be competitive with your fellow actors who, you know, acting is a very strange thing to, to sort of line up and say this is better than that and this is better than that because it's so specific to each role. And so, you know, I love the camaraderie that I have with my fellow actors and I don't like competition in that sense. And so it makes me very uncomfortable, but at the same time you're on a campaign and they expect you to be campaigning and they they you know, you have to go do your little speech and show up and and do all that stuff, which I understand. I, I get it and I and I and I I I I um I have a lot of respect for it. Uh but it isn't it's not my thing 100%. What I can say is that if I do get to go there again, I'm going to enjoy it. Um, I made it a point to enjoy it last time. It's, it's rare. I, I, uh, I can't even believe that um, there's even a second, maybe a second shot at it in a, in a career. Uh, I never saw myself having the kind of success that I've been blessed with. So, um, you know, I don't know what to say other than, <laughs> other than it's tough and I'm grateful uh, for, for it happening if it does. Now, uh, you've had a chance to experience how the Oscar season has, has sort of evolved over the last decade. Just the idea of an Oscar campaign has sort of exploded in the last 10 to 15 years. I mean, you know. One of your you know, earlier breakthrough films, you can count on me had you know Oscar attention and and going straight through to you know the kids are all right and now Foxcatcher coming up. How much has it changed? Uh, uh, you know your experience of it since you know you know from that early from that early experience. Well, um, you count on me. You know I was sort of watching from the sidelines a little bit. It, it um, and it was. Uh, I wasn't inside of it, so all I saw was this kind of magical thing that was happening for this little movie and these people that I loved, you know, uh, Kenny and Laura. And and so um, 
I, I, I didn't get to experience it in the way that they did or the idea of a campaign, and, and I would hear them talk about it, and it didn't sound like it was a lot of fun. And so, um, but, 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 but when, I, when I got to um, The Kids Are All Right, I got to see it firsthand. And it's, you know, I don't know what it was like in the past, it seems like um, it is. There's more uh, campaign stops added every year uh, along the along the road, um, and uh, it's it's kind of leading up to the Oscars is just as kind of as important as the Oscars, and it has as many of events that are important to uh, people in my industry as the Oscars themselves. So I don't know how it's changed. It'll be interesting to be able to compare it from this one. It was just this kind of magical thing that happened with "You Can Count on Me," and and also to be to be honest with you, with um, the kids are all right. I I had I didn't expect that movie to to do that. I don't, I don't think anybody did. It, it, it took forever to even get it made. I think these smaller and these independent movies rely and count up more on uh, awards attention than any other because that's what, you know, they, they may not get even noticed by the mass public otherwise. That's kind of the gift of it. And, and, and we've been seeing more, um, more of these movies being, being honored this way. And yes, that is a blessing for the smaller films that people may not get, be able to see or may not come to their local you know cineplex or multiplex um, but because of the awards they get a nice little boost into the mainstream media and little movies like you could count on me and the kids are all right um, have their little day in the sun which is which is a huge blessing I want to ask you uh, along these lines. I, I'm guessing you, you've been an Academy member for a while now. You know, it was funny. I I um, I got a invitation to become an Academy member um, just before uh, you can count on me. And it's strange. Somebody nominates you, and it came to me. I, and I, uh, me, they, uh, in the Academy, I haven't even done anything. They, uh, they didn't even know who I am at, the, at this time. You know. And there was somebody who's never revealed themselves to me who came out and, and nominated me to be part of the Academy. And so it's been since then that I have been a member of the Academy. Well, I ask this to most members that I get a chance to talk to, and I'd love to get your take. And you don't have to reveal any specific names if you don't want to, but you talked about competition, especially among actors. I'm wondering when you've got that nominating ballot or you've got that final ballot to vote for winners, what kind of crosses through your mind? What 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 determines who's you know who it will get a Mark Ruffalo vote? What do they have to do? What kind of performances? What 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 grabs your attention? I uh, it, bravery, uh, soul, um, um, uh, just pure craft, or something that's just magical beyond words sort of those those performances that leave you in wonder of, of film and and the possibilities of it and and the possibilities of people acting in it um, but it's um, it's usually something that strikes me in a in a in a deep kind of way uh, in a in a emotional way I would say do you ever just stare at a category and, and just can't decide? <laughs> I, to be honest with you, I've had to go to my wife for tiebreakers. Uh, <laughs> I say, I've got it down to A and B. Which one would you pick? Help me. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, in addition to you know potential award season, you know the Emmys coming up, the Oscars coming up next year, you're also caught up in in one of the biggest fandoms in current film, you know, working on you know the Avengers films, uh, you know which is one of the biggest franchises in the world. I, I'm wondering what what kind of adjustment it is to go from you know a, you know a more intimate project like a Fox Catcher or a Normal Heart to you know that big you know huge set pieces and action scenes and, and visual effects and, and all that? Um, 
it, it's definitely different, and uh, but but each film is kind of different, and each film has its own sort of problems to work out. It ha has its own sort of um, mood, has its own sort of work um, pace, and uh, and so they're all so different from each other. It's this thing has been such a such a phenomenon. And and the the folks that I'm working with, I I really had we've developed a really nice relationship over the years. I've never been in, in, in anything that had a sequel to it, and so and Marvel really takes care of of us, um, and they 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 really do, uh, you know Jeremy Latrum and Kevin Feige. And, and of course, Joss Whedon, Patty Witcher, these they really do listen to the actor, and they really do love the actor and respect the actor, and they respect what we do and how we do it. And so, it's a lot of fun going there because there's a lot of time. Uh, we have the best of the best of everything. It's as close as you are. As I will ever get to uh, being kind of a, a little quasi rock star uh, in, in 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 a world that um, that is sort of very fleeting and fanciful, but but not deeply meaningful. Um, and so, I just never saw myself in that world. Uh, and you know, I'm I'm get, I'm 47 years old. I I I I want to. I want to look back at my life and enjoy it, and and say that I enjoyed it. And so that that's been what I've been doing. I've been enjoying I've been enjoying every second of it, and and taking it kind of as it comes. And it's been coming really beautifully. And Joss Whedon's a great director and a really great writer. So we get to do some wonderful stuff in a big giant Hollywood extravaganza. Any talk yet of a, a separate Hulk movie like some of these other uh, guys and girls are getting? Please, I I don't know. Uh, there's it went from an an absolutely not to a maybe in the past uh, few years. Um, you know, I think it's a tough nut to crack, honestly. Um, and they've already done a couple of them. Uh, there's another issue is Universal holds the rights to an independent Hulk film. And so there's there's a lot um, there's a lot in the mix that that make it uh, difficult. Uh, I think uh, it's not as easy as some of the other ones just to pick up and, and take off with. And it's tough to tell a story about a guy who doesn't want you to do the exact thing that you want him to do, <laughs> and keep it interesting and compelling. So. You know the, the the people that I follow in this part, I, I have a huge amount of admiration for, and I and and until I think they can we can come up with something that that's different enough, I don't think it should be touched. Yeah, I called my brother a few minutes ago, uh, right before this chat. It's his birthday today, and he's a big fan of all that stuff. And he said uh, to ask you if you knew this trivia. You are the only the second person ever to play the Hulk twice. Somebody else uh, asked me, told me that the other day. First of all, happy birthday! And um, I hadn't thought about it that way, but that's true. My, you know, I, 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 I want to keep my good luck streak going. I don't want to push it. It's pretty nice. Uh, well, uh, we have a, a question in our chat room. One last question uh, from Charles uh, Cherchio. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm butchering his name. Uh, he says he's been a longtime fan. Uh, and he he wants to know uh, who your influences were, sort of starting out. Um, you know, uh, to be totally honest with you, Marlon Brando uh, was a big uh, influence on me as a young actor. I, I I didn't even know who it was, who he was, um, and everyone in school would talk about it. But but when I was a little boy about um, eight years old, maybe nine years old, my grandmother um, would let me sneak down from my bedroom and let me sit on the couch and watch TV with her. And this one night she said to me, hey, there's a, a, a movie on tonight, and it's a very special movie, and come down and watch it. It's a, it's a television world premiere of it. 
And I watched it, and I saw this actor doing something that I had never seen anyone do on television. Now, when you're eight years old, television is a very abstract thing. You're, you, I didn't really understand what acting was. Totally. But I saw him. Uh, well, you're Foxy first, uh, you know, I, I saw, you know, and I said to him, I turned to my grandma, I was like, who is that? What is he doing? And she said the name, but it didn't, didn't, didn't click with me. I mean, I didn't know who anyone was. And I said, I, I, and she said, he's an actor. I said, I, I want to do that. And so years later, I, I was a jock and I surfer and skate, all this stuff. But like somewhere inside me was this little eight-year-old boy. I was like, I want to be an actor, but nobody, you can't make it as an actor. I don't know where to start. Um, I did a play. I went to acting school, Marlon Brando, Marlon Brando, Marlon Brando, you don't know who Marlon, no, I don't know who Marlon Brando is, blah, blah, blah. Finally, one of my friends shows up at my house with a beta VHS, VHS big giant beta recorder, you know, carries it in, plops it down, plugs it into the television, and we start watching Streetcar Named Desire. And I'm sitting there, and I swear to you, I can't. I hadn't seen that movie or heard of that movie or knew what that movie was since I was eight years old, and I'm sitting there watching it, and it's all coming back to me. And um, and then of course it, it just became a rush of, of finding out as much as I could about him, watching everything that I could could see about him, and. Um, yeah, he's been a he's been a, a big influence. I mean, there's been a lot of other ones. Marcello Mastroianni is a big one for me. Um, Robert Downey Jr. Uh, Sean Penn. I, I've had a you know the greats. Some of them. Well, Mark, good luck at the Emmys. You got two nominations coming up in here in a few weeks. I, I know you're overseas, but I hope you're going to get to make the ceremony. Oh, I'll, I'll be there. Definitely, I'll be there. I well, good luck, wait. and thanks for joining us, especially through all the technical issues. No, thank you for, for being patient with me, and thanks to, uh, to all the folks there who, who've had to go through this three times now. <laughs> so long.